We're up. Welcome to Nurturing Our Nature. Podcast will begin in just a few minutes. Today we'll be talking about habit formation, goals, as well as how we can incentivize our behaviors. Stay tuned, starting in just a few minutes. And the link has been sent. Fantastic. Fantastic. It's great. I love it's, it. It's great. Chancho. <laughs> Chancho, look. I need I'm to so talk. I'm so glad you understood the reference, too. So <laughs> it's fantastic. It's fantastic. They're like, like, yeah. Is it like his freaking face says it all, bro? I wake up every day and make soup. <laughs> oh. Did you not tell them they were the large chips? <laughs> I've had the diarrhea since Easter's. Easter's. Nacho Libre, bro. Easter's. Never get old, bro. Uh, there was one time where I was having um, like a Mexican dinner, you know, nachos and tacos. And I'm like, you know, I'm just going to put Nacho Libre on Netflix on for like the background noise, just for the aesthetic. You know, I just want to hear that intro song. I am, I am. <laughs> I uh, think yeah. I am. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I ended up watching the whole movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got a comment. I need to borrow some sweats. <laughs> Janjo. Get that out of my face. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Today, we won't be talking about Nacho Libre. Unless you could somehow relate it to habitual behaviors. Today, we're going to find the eagle egg that give you the power. I think it was an eagle egg, wasn't it? Yeah, it was he like, like that, going on a boat. He chugs it. He got to drink like, the egg. Before he jumps off, he literally farts, and it's, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I like that that movie did not take it so seriously at any point. Oh, that's great. That's the, it, it's, the same, it's the same makers of Napoleon Dynamite. That's probably why. Right, right, yeah classics dude well go ahead and kick us off buddy all right where uh, were we so i'll just give us a quick recap of last time kind of some of the concepts we talked about to bring us up to speed um so we kind of discussed how habits can easily go against the will habits layer themselves in the context of other habits so Let's say that you have a conscious goal in mind. That habit takes on automaticity, meaning that that habit becomes something that's automatic. It's not something that really that takes a lot of conscious effort. If you put yourself in the right context, that habit will just sort of take over um, and have an automatic nature to it. So habits can go against the will, meaning that the things that you want to accomplish in your life, if you put yourself in the wrong context, you might find yourself falling into behaviors that aren't in your best interest, which is the will. So for example, if I put myself in my room with all the lights off and I really want to study, well, I'm putting myself in a context that might not be that conducive. And instead, what I'm going to do is end up going into a state of napping 
because I've set a context that essentially lends me to go against the will that I have, which is at that point in time, I would like to study, but my context is not appropriate for that. So there are some things that you can do um, to kind of offset that. But it's just really interesting how habits can layer themselves in the context of other habits. Um, not just that, but you're talking about things that you do preceding a behavior. This chapter also goes on to the power of outcome of behavior and how positive outcomes can actually incentivize you to repeat that behavior again and thus forming habits. It's a right. reward, whether you're preparing, which we've seen positives from that, or you're rewarding. Both of those have a biological mechanism in our behavior. And that's a super behaviorist approach. Um, the book calls it the SR. It's like SR. What was it? SR stimulus. So that's like stimulus response, basically suggesting like it's a more behaviorist view on why we do what we do as human beings. So basically, if I give myself a certain stimulus, I'm going to have some kind of response to that. And that's typically associated with some rewards. So if I study, then I get the cookie. So yeah. that sort of thing you can kind of it, it's not like the book kind of goes into how it's not that straightforward in terms of human behavior. Like there's a lot of nuance to it. It's not as simple as you can just condition yourself to enjoy studying by giving yourself like the same reward every single time you do a certain behavior. Like there's a little bit more nuance to it, um, which we'll discuss in a little bit. I mean, we're very complex. Um, it's not just a matter of giving a dog a treat whenever you hear a little bell. And the next thing you know, you're just salivating you're <laughs> before the treat's even there. Little Pavlov. Yeah. Little doggy treat. Now, the thing is that even though our behaviors and our habits are much more complex than that, finding ways to simplify it to represent something to that simplicity, I think is within our within our grasp, the more we have self awareness, the more we are able to categorize and break down the behavior and the goal that we want to attain. I think there's ways of finding incentives for each of those steps. Now we talked what? about before the, the measures that you could take to prepare. What are examples of rewards that happen? Uh, for instance, one that we probably don't even do consciously, I think is like the reward from working out and the consistency of it and seeing the gains, you know, Ooh. what <laughs> golly, you just got me on two different trains of thought. Okay. Here. Okay. Okay. Go on the first one, table the workout one. Cause I know you can go on a tangent with that one. Table that one for now. Okay. What was the original thought? The original thought is what, what could we, what could we consider a good reward? Like what is a, what is a beneficial reward in the context of habit formation? Because like, there's a lot of things that we could do to give ourselves something to keep going. But like, what, what could we do to define something as a good reward, you know? I feel like it would be something that something that in some ways like refuels you so that you can get back to the habit again. Yeah, because you look at, um, you know, the work hard, play hard mentality. If you play too hard, you're not going to work too hard Monday. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know? You definitely uh, can find rewards that are conducive to your health, mental and physical, and that prepare you to tackle the next challenge versus rewards that are potentially self-destructive um, or very taxing on your, on your mind, body, and spirit. Uh, but, you know, with that said, on a personal basis, people need to realize what actions what hobbies maybe fuel them 
it's a very personal thing and, and you have to really know yourself to understand what gives you energy because for someone reading a book might give them energy for other people reading a book might get them to fall asleep you know it really depends i think that's a great question though because it makes you put some intentionality into the reward that you want to give yourself you know you don't want to just go to work and then your reward is getting home and being a couch potato and drinking 12 beers Eho. yeah because i think i think it is like it's good to call that to mind because it can actually like make us plan. It's like if I understand that this reward that I'm giving me will actually hurt me in the long run, like it's not much of a reward, is it? Because it's realistically, it's this short term pleasure. So we're going to get into this conversation just a smidge, but like there's certain things that we can give ourselves that really don't reward us too much because what happens is essentially we increase the threshold that it takes to feel good again. So when you give yourself short-term pleasure, every time you do that repeatedly, the threshold for you to feel that same amount of good vibes, essentially, as you're doing something that's more difficult, like going to work, it increases. And that's 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 true. Uh, Andrew Huberman, I love talking about this guy. He talks about how participating in short-term habits, or, or I'm sorry, not short-term habits, short-term pleasures essentially increases the threshold that it takes for you to experience pleasure with the more difficult things in life. So for example, reading is a good one or like you trying to study or you trying to work, you trying to do your desk job, that sort of thing. It's like, is it actually a reward though? And so it, it it's, every, it's a balance game though. You know, it's like sometimes you do need that short term something just to like take your mind off of the stress of life. Cause life Life rains on everybody sometimes and it's you can't escape it. You can you can bring your umbrella, but it's got holes in it. The way I see it is you have vacation level rewards and you have a little like a little yogurt parfait with some like chocolate sprinkle type reward. You have rewards that are nice to have when you reach checkpoints they're nice to have let's say midterm rewards right midterm rewards take a vacation you need that you know you reached you've been working hard for months you've been able to attain multiple short-term goals you reached a point where you're a little you're a little tired you're a little gassed out from all the mental energy it's taken you to maintain this drive you know like we've talked about before we only have so much of that drive right it's limited in ourselves so take that vacation but you can't take a vacation every 30 minutes every time you've crossed something off your to-do list you know so there, there's got to be a difference in how you reward yourself and when now and it'll, if it'll it'll ultimately mean less like if you do give yourself, like you're saying, a vacation every time you check something off your to-do list, like the more frequently you reward yourself, in a sense, the less meaning that reward has and the less you're able to enjoy it. Because in this life, scarcity is what creates value. And that that's a philosophical truth that I love to throw out because it, it holds true for everything. And it seems that human neurochemicals operate in conjunction with that. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're absolutely on point. Thanks for supporting that. Uh, it's really a matter of being able to recognize what kind of reward you need and when. So an example for attaining your short-term goals might be having a snack, you know? Now, that snack, and you can't have, you can't have a, a chocolate bar every time you finish something off your to-do list. But if you have, like, maybe a little little bowl of fruits, small bowl, just a little, some little berries, some antioxidants mm. in there, you know what I'm saying? And then do what you want to make that spicy, you know, throw some like yogurt on there or like a little bit of whipped cream, you know, like it's like 0.1 calories. <laughs> do it. You know, that's good for you. It's going to help you. And if that's what it takes to reward you after doing your task, that's great. 
I would encourage that. You just got to be able to recognize which ones are healthy and which ones aren't when it comes to those short-term rewards. But I'm sure you could find some. And, and it's going to vary from person to person. I think when you're trying to bulk, this is one of the best things to do. <laughs> Food rewards become that Pavlov dog and complete your task and then give yourself a little like smoothie, you know, a little protein right. smoothie with peanut butter and chocolate. Mm, that's my go to right there. That's my go to. It's so good. I can't say dessert, but it's not, you know, when you're bulking, it's like it's gains. I'm, I'm one to talk. I'm still super skinny. Got to talk to my man, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, what do you eat? What's your what's your protein gains dessert treat? Protein gains dessert bacon treat. strips. Oh my! Don't get me started on bacon, man. <laughs> I I've had to take a break from bacon because <laughs> me me and bacon we had we got a little too close, man. We got it got it got a little too close to my heart, literally. <laughs> um, like grease, like that grease, man. You know, the best um, is when you make that bacon and then you take the bacon out and you fry some eggs in that oh, grease. Bro, that's what I do. That's what oh I my do. Gosh. It, it hurts so good when it's splashing on you. You're like oh, yeah. cooking shirtless. You're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> but when it goes in my belly, when it so goes good. in my belly, so it's good. worth it. I can't flush this down the sink. I got to eat it. I got to eat all the grease. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> oh, my God. But yeah, I mean, in this book, it's, uh, as we mentioned before, The Psychology of Habits, edited by Vash Verplanken, published in uh, Bath, UK. Uh, you know, it says something along the lines of, in a goal-setting scenario, the idea of a reward cue, it trains your mind into performing a skill to attain that reward, to attain that stimuli. Now, stimuli, it's interesting. Stimuli is something I would use prior to a behavior. But if you do it as a reward, it actually stimulates you doing that behavior again in the future. It stimulates the repetition of that behavior. It's not a trick. You're training your mind. You're training it. You're giving it that little, little incentive. Hey, if you do this again next week, you get another little mini vacay. Whether that be your little yoga parfait, whether that be going out, you know, with the boys, going to Top Golf or something. Nice. I want to go to the batting cage. I haven't done that in a while. If I could do a batting cage, if I could do some kind of swinging sport every week, racquetball, though, that's another one. Racquetball's good. I like, I like wall ball with my tennis racket. <laughs> wall ball, yeah. Is it good. the same thing? Isn't racquetball like technically a wall ball type of game? I think it's. I think the racket is different than the tennis racket. I think it's like a, or is it? Yeah, no, racket know. ball rackets are different than tennis rackets. They have a, the I'm not using technical words, but the strings they have a different level of uh, tension than the tennis rackets do, and then the balls obviously are different as well. Gotcha. So those kind of play a role. Also, the racquetball rackets have like a flat. They're not like completely oval. At the end of the oval, they kind of get flat because if you ever get a ball that's like flying close to the wall, if you have a flat edge, you can kind of like scrape it off the wall, you know? True. Yeah. This is the racket ball or the tennis racket is more round. So I get like a little bit more reach when you're like, <laughs> when you're Serena Williams saying that thing, you know? Hurrah! Hurrah! Actually, I haven't seen her in a while, but. Good for her. I hope she's doing good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so along the lines of what you're talking about, I also want to sprinkle in there the importance of a consistent environment as you're forming that habit. Um, I would like to discuss how important it is that time of day or physical location or the preceding actions in that sequence that you try and meet one of those elements so that your habit can actually ingrain itself into your day-to-day -day activities. So that would look something like what I've been doing lately, uh, literally putting out my running shoes and socks on my dresser so that the night before I'm ready to go. So when I wake up in the morning and I got that morning doo-doo brain, like I literally have no excuse but to roll out of bed to look 
in that direction and see that, oh, this is what I need to do. And the habit, like we discussed, it, it requires less conscious effort. As I wake up in the morning, I feel more use to the sensation of just getting out of bed and putting on my running shoes and getting out the door. It, there's less there's less mental resistance, so it costs less willpower in a sense. That means that I don't have to like motivate myself as much because the habit has really started to take hold in my life. So those days where I wake up and I know that I have my shoes and everything there, it's like all the context has been appropriately set. So the night before, I've kind of set the tone for the next day. And that's kind of like one of those habits that layer themselves into the larger scheme of things. Yeah, that's a great example of uh, preparation to train that reward, to train that habit rather. And I guess in your case, the reward is having a, a productive morning. That's what's encouraging you to put the shoes out the next night. Because, you know, if you do that, you're going to be rewarded by a walkies, a little jog, whatever it is that you do that freshens you up and makes you feel, you know, enlightened and refreshed the next morning before you get to whatever task you have to get, you know, work and do. The, uh, the release of endogenous opioids. It's kind of <laughs> that's what we discuss in school. You literally it's it's the runner's high. Um, it's endogenous opioids. So it makes you feel like Ooh, real good, real good. That's the runner's high. Now, in pharmaceutical terms, opioids are used as uh, painkillers, right? Typically, you are painkillers. So you, you don't. I Physical therapy uh, stands as one of the pillars against, I would say, the opioid epidemic because we're or one of the options that you have essentially to reduce your pain without taking opioids. So people like medical practitioners at this point, um, as we ally ourselves with them even closer, um, they're recommending physical therapy over opioids because of all the side effects that opioids tend to have. Um, the obvious, obvious addictive properties as well. So let's talk about that. Okay. It seems like there's two approaches here to a problem. You have a physical pain caused by a muscle, a tendon, and your two options are to numb the pain, taking an opioid, or are to work through the pain until eventually reaching a point where your physical therapy and your determination to remain consistent with physical therapy actually strengthens the muscles, the tendons and the the working muscles in conjunction in that area till the pain is more tolerable due to your own strengthening of your body, right? Versus just numbing it. Am I in the ballpark there? I mostly agree with you. However, I'm not I'm not one to actually come this is a this is a recent, I would say, mind shift because I used to be all like, nah, man, none of that medication stuff. You don't need that in your life because you can just you can just physical therapy. And nah, I would say uh, recently my mindset has been more like the short term, uh, the short term treatment to get you out of the acute stage of pain, which is the first three days. That's when you're in the inflammatory phase. Um, you really want to like get some kind of pain relief with that. If it's a, if it's a more, uh, I would say severe injury, um, there's, there's stuff that you want to do that is uh, medical intervention that I think is very beneficial. Um, however, to become totally reliant upon that medicine um, and to not actually address the underlying structures that have been weakened as a result of that injury, um, I think that's very detrimental in the long term. And it does require, and this is this is where a medical model sort of fails. It does require some work. There is physical therapy isn't a pill. We are giving people the tools essentially to help their body along the path to healing. So it does require work um, with proper guidance and like sometimes some of the techniques we do. Like I personally love manual therapy where it's like hands-on work. I'm getting in there. And the tissues that are hypomobile, like I'm getting in there and moving that stuff like that's for me, it's super rewarding. But 
that's more of like, that's kind of like my short term fix for you. But then I still have to get you the right tools to go home and do your own work in your own time. You get homework from us. So if you, if you don't, if you don't do your homework, you're going to fail the test, which is, you know, essentially feeling better. Now let's relate this back to what we were talking about with rewards. Using painkillers or using physical therapy at the end of the day, the goal is to alleviate the pain and heal the traumatized area. And I agree with you, the acute use of painkillers, you know, you have to have some level of sympathy and empathy for your patients because you can't just tell them, man, uh, hey, quit being such a baby, you know? It's just knee surgery. We just put a piece of metal on your knee. Just move <laughs> it and right. bend it real quick. Yeah, Don't no, worry I about it. it. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally get that. The acute use of it is great, but the chronic use of it is a problem. Um, now, the, I think the issue here is people see the goal, which is relieve the pain, and they take the acute solution, which is the painkiller, and think, why can't I just keep using this as a chronic solution? I achieved the goal and I look, I did it. I achieved it. And just one day I took this pill and I'm alleviated. I've reached my goal, you know, of, of being pain free. And then now that stimulates that person to use it again and incentivizes them to reach their goal instantly with the painkiller. And then they become dependent on it versus using work and physical therapy, which can be painful, especially as you start to lower the dose of your painkiller. But eventually using physical therapy can get you to that same goal. In fact, I would say it's even a better outcome because you, you reach this point of pain relief, but you've done so by strengthening yourself and you're no longer dependent on medication to do so. So what, what do you think you could do to convince your patients that the rewarding goal, which in turn becomes a rewarding stimuli to a habitual behavior, how do you convince them it's the PT versus the painkiller? to achieve that goal, you know? I mean, it would take a really, this is also another reason why I love physical therapies because I get time with my patients. Um, most, most healthcare providers really don't get more than I'd say 20 minutes and then say 10 to 20 minutes with their patients. Um, physical therapy, I get anywhere from like, I'd say 35, 40 minutes up to 60 minutes with my patients. Um, which is nice. So that gives me plenty of time to address the patient's psychological um, psychological state towards uh, their healing um, and getting them into the right psychological state of understanding that, hey, you understand that, you know, this medication that you're taking, while it does reduce the pain, it's it's not one of those things that is the long-term solution. And I think kind of helping the patient understand that anything in this life that is sort of worth it is going to take a little bit of effort. Um, it's kind of like you have to convince the patient to sort of accept some of the discomfort that comes with getting off of drug therapy. And that's not an easy thing to do, but if you're able to kind of convince the patient that you won't need any exogenous source of anything, like you can be 100% healthy without the need to take anything. Like if you can get that point across to the patient and tell them that with a little bit of effort on your end, you won't have to pay for drug therapy anymore. You won't need to reach out to your insurance company to make sure that they're going to cover this medication anymore. You won't need more regular visits with your physician. If you take this 
a little bit seriously and you actually put in the effort, like the second that I have that conversation with the patient, I can sit there, look at them in the eyes and like sit there and like say, Hey, you put in this effort, buddy. Look, like you're going to be, you're going to be drug free. You don't need any of this stuff. Your body is sufficient the way that it is. You just got to put in a little effort. So that's kind of how I would go about that. Yeah. You educate them on the benefits of the PT. Um, I would also imagine educating them on the downsides, the negative implications of becoming dependent on the uh, painkiller is also a great way to de-incentivize them from considering that as a chronic solution. Because once they go down that road, obviously the psychology of addiction shows that it's, it's really hard to get people off of this stuff, you know? But if you can yeah. preventatively teach them the dangers of becoming addicted to these painkillers, that might also lead them down the path of using PT. Also, there's there's a lot of side effects to painkillers in short term too. Like there's like nausea, you know. Yeah. There's a. And that plays like draws that you can get with just just a few weeks of using this stuff. That plays right into human psychology, um, which is we tend to pay more attention to negative stimulus. So if there is something that is causing me pain, I am more likely to pay attention to that than I am to something that is going well in my life. And like, that's what the psychological literature is kind of talking about now. It's a really interesting set of um, discussion that they're having, but it's like office managers pay attention to the 10% of workers that are essentially making mistakes compared to the 90% of workers who are doing their job well. So it's pretty interesting. Like we're going to pay attention to that 10% of stuff that is not going well over the 90% that is. So I wonder why that is. I mean, they, they haven't, they haven't said why that is the case. It's just what humans do. It's like human psychology. We pay attention to the negative over the positive. So I can say maybe evolutionarily, that's because the things that pose a direct threat to our survivability, that's why we pay attention to those things. Yeah. I mean, that, that it's would like a be direct, a, you know, it's a, it's a direct red flag. It's hard to ignore. Right. Now that, that also though, that 90% of people that are doing things successfully, that the people that are performing as they should, rather than penalizing those that aren't doing well enough, Maybe we got to find ways to implement rewards for those that are doing their tasks efficiently, and productively. And that goes back to what we started this podcast about. If you want to make a behavior, a habitual behavior, one good way to do so is by incentivizing it with a reward. And that's shown in, in any example that you see when it comes to implementing healthy and productive, like we said before, like the little vacation rewards. But if you could find some magical short-term one, the thing is that I think the short-term rewards, those are the most personable ones. Those are the ones that really, you have to find what makes, what gives you that little jolt of satisfaction that allows you to keep working for. It's almost like giving yourself a little bit of a dopamine rush short-term controlled, right? Controlled mm -hmm. dopamine rush in order for you to accomplish your long-term serotonin goals. And then once you reach that long-term serotonin goal, that's when you do the little vacation, you know, reward. I love that you said controlled dopamine rush. And yes. that, that really, it, that's such a key word that you use when you say control, because it, like I said earlier, it adds so much meaning to that moment. Let's say you give yourself, if I learn this passage of music, uh, 20 notes here. If I finish learning this 20 notes, I'm going to give myself a chocolate, like let's say a Snickers. I'm not sponsored by Snickers. Um, but you're not let's, you when you're hungry. You're not you when you're hungry. Um, <laughs> let's say that I gave myself like a small Snickers snack. Um, if you do that in a controlled fashion where you're not like, I'm going to eat 30 Snickers. Like if you do that in a controlled fashion, it, it it's actually more rewarding that way because you get like this just this little taste 
of what the the long term reward will feel like. It's almost like a short term reward, like it hints at what that sensation will feel like when you actually sit there and put in the work and you get to that long term goal and you actually accomplish it. So it's like, yeah, don't go overboard with the short term rewards and like overdo it and like really just sit there and like waste like two hours reveling in the fact that I just learned this passage of notes or that I just finished this one homework assignment. Like, no, just make it like this short moment and like savor that short moment. It's almost like be be in a meditative state as you're doing it because you're like, ah, yes. Be very present because if, right. if it's controlled, you're going to train yourself to be very present because it's not going to last forever. You can't indulge. You can't have this gluttonous reward that you just are bathing in for an extended amount of time where you just forget your responsibilities altogether. Instead, you're just very present and you get to savor, you know, whether it's whether it's food or not that you're using as your reward. I think savor is still a great way to explain what happens when you start to appreciate a goal that is really tailored for you after accomplishing a short term task. You really get to savor it. Let that seep in. And then, boom, you're ready. You go right back to the next task. You could do this multiple times a day. Just don't keep eating Snickers. Just switch it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> switch it up a little bit, you know? Right. Definitely possible. And I think that using other habitual behaviors as mini vacations. Now, bear with me here. You got the short-term savory reward, like the Snickers, right? Then you got little mini vacations in your day. Now, Renee, what are you talking about? You, you just said you can't take vacations after every task. After working for five hours, after working for six, seven, eight hours, take a little mini vacation. Go to the gym. Go for a walk. If you live close enough to a beach or a park, go there. Savor that. It might no, I'm not saying go to the park for five minutes. All right, cool. That was great. He said to savor it. Little Snickers bar of a park and then just leave. No, go go enjoy it. Go there. Go there for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And find what really speaks to you. And again, I encourage you to be mindful and present in that moment. Really seep it in. If you have company, go with them. You can really just layer these habitual behaviors to benefit not just yourself but others as well you know go with a family or a friend and just appreciate this this moment that you guys are sharing together you guys could be working on completely different tasks you know a great example is working right you guys have different jobs but you guys both get home after that job and whether you're having dinner or it's your walk after dinner you know whatever example you want to use for your mini vacation do that enjoy it and believe it or not, I bet if you choose a task that isn't gluttonous, for example, going home and binge watching TV after you get home from work, if you choose a task that isn't gluttonous, it's a quick little 40, 50 minutes, even an hour and a half. I don't know how long you need, you know, the gym games might vary. Mm -hmm. I bet you can get back to work. I bet you can get back not to your nine to five job, but I, get, I bet you can get back to building something else on the side. And then guess what? Boom. After an hour of doing your little side hustle from six to seven, seven to eight, another little mini Snickers. And you can just have a whole day full, filled with rewards. But the point, the key thing here is there are rewards after you've accomplished the task. Because if your day is just filled with Snickers and you didn't get anything done, the Snickers are going to start to lose meaning, and you're just going to find the habitual behavior is eating Snickers. Snickers, sponsor us, please. Uh, <laughs> dude, yeah, we've name dropped that a lot. This um, dude, but I love I love the examples that you're throwing out in terms of rewards, like going for a walk or going to the gym. These are all things that essentially like mentally prime us to enjoy almost like a a slower release of reward states, a slower release of enjoyment from life, like going on a walk and being mindful of that walk. It's like you're rewarding yourself. Yes, but you're not you're not like throwing yourself into like an immediate like 
like dopamine rush, which then leads to the subsequent crash. Um, and one of these episodes, we're going to have to hit that because it it's such it's such an amazing thing to discuss, um, like like uh, limbic system neuroscience, how we can actually like the psychological literature that we're talking about now is so in line with the neurochemical release. Um, it's it's just great. But I, I love I love those examples of rewards that you gave, because those are things that like, yes, they're rewards. And kind of like you said, like, it's not like you get into this world, you binge watch and you're a freaking zombie when you're done. Like, nah, man, you go out for a walk, you call that walk your reward and you like thoroughly enjoy it. You're present. Yeah. You can get into your side hustle, whether that's like trading Bitcoin or like doing art or doing some kind of instrument, whatever that side hustle is. Like, if you want to do that, like choose rewards that actually enrich you, that fill you up. As opposed to like give you the quick fix and then crash you immediately because dopamine neuroscience says when you hit a high you have to hit a low so you can return back to tonic okay wow. so that's that's how it works it's literally you when you hit an elevated state of of dopamine in your limbic system you have to hit a low state for you to return back to your baseline the body likes homeostasis in all instances, whether that's hemodynamics or we're talking about freaking overall muscle function, like the body likes homeostasis. And this also goes for your reward system. So so play in line with with your body's rules because you got it like you're stuck to this body. So you got to use the rules that are given to you. Dude, that that really just screams nurturing our nature right there. You got to play by the rules that your body is coded with. You can't help it. I'd say that's you, it's in your DNA. And we have enough research now that shows it is very correlated. Like you said, the highs and lows, that's beautiful. The crash that you get from using social media, which I will continue to bash on, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care if I, I, I use it every now and then. I mean, who doesn't right in our generation, but man, these reels, that is the OD. That is the overdose of painkillers in social media form. You know, when I open YouTube now, it doesn't. It used to go to my like homepage or my subscribers, like my subscription page, right? Right. Now, when I open YouTube on my phone, it opens reels. It opens the YouTube shorts first. And on the phone, that's the only thing you see. So you just slide. And like before you even remember why you were on YouTube, what you were trying to search, you're now scrolling. And after 40 minutes of that, you crash, if not more. You know, TikTok, obviously, people could be on that the whole day. The whole day. It's 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 a lie. It's it's almost like a lie, bro. It's a cheap reward. You're giving yourself a reward for nothing. You didn't work for it, but yet you're telling your brain, you're filling your limbic system up with all these reward chemicals and you've accomplished nothing. Your your neurochemicals are saying, I've just accomplished this great task. I feel I feel like, oh, I did it. I did this thing. And actually, no. <laughs> like high with dopamine. Yeah. No, seriously, man. That's right. how it feels when you're scrolling. You're like, oh, oh. Okay, you, you, chill, you just, <laughs> you, just no, you just you just you just keep on going, bro. And it's like <laughs> it's 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 like a it's cheap. It's like you didn't work for it, so it doesn't mean anything to you psychologically. But in your monkey brain, in your reward system, it's still it still hits just like you did something great. That's where there's there's like a disconnect. It's almost like you're lying to yourself. And then when you're talking about the highs and the the dampening of that dopamine stimuli receptor. Now, if you try to go back, oh, no, okay, I was watching Nurturing Our Nature, and they told me to complete a short-term task, work for like one hour, and then eat a Snickers bar. That Snickers bar is not going to make you feel any kind of good if you spent five hours on TikTok that day. Yeah, you can't even, you can't you can't even save your taste. You can't compete. Yeah, your, your taste buds are fried. They're saturated. Yeah. You've gone below. You've gone way below tonic. You're, you're hypotonic here. So that that sucks. Because um, now you it, and it's funny because now you can't appreciate the small nuances, like like 
looking at a tree and the leaves on that tree, if you've spent your entire day in a very meditative, mindful state, you can look at a tree, bro, and you can straight up get like enjoyment from that. If you're in, if you're in the right mindset. And you've really like you've had a nice slow day, a very mindful day where you've done nothing but walking. This is a dopamine detox day per se. Like mm-hmm. you've done nothing but write a little bit of reading, meditating, walking, exercising and calorie foods that aren't like super like super sweet, and salty, that sort of thing. Yeah, like uh, that'd be a day where your reward is just a, a little Greek yogurt with like some raspberries in it. There's no Snickers bar that day. No Snickers. You're like extra, extra simplified. Yeah. Then when the next day when you eat that Snickers bar, you can be like, mm. this is the mm. whole vacation in my mouth. <laughs> mm. Soli Sullivan, bro. You know that meme no where he steps that, on that. Please. He steps on that thing. <laughs> His eyes go big. It's like <clears throat> overbaked. <laughs> wow. Preceding stimuli versus outcome stimuli. Preceding habits, preceding behaviors, dampening the reward of an outcome stimuli. They're all related. It's all just how you how you use it, how you layer it, how you lay it out in your day to day, week to week, month to month. Habits can... are like onions. They have layers. <laughs> oh man. I was just watching Shrek the other day too. <laughs> and not by choice either. I went to do laundry and it's just playing in the Bro. in the laundromat. That's one of those things where it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're doing laundry, you're freaking doing the dishes, Shrek's on, you're gonna sit down and watch it. You gotta see some of it. Yeah. Just a little bit, at least. Right. Nice. Just a little mindful moment right there. Just breathe. Remember how good that feels. Cool. I think... Uh... I think the breath, the reason why that's so powerful in meditation, this, I don't want to dive too deep into this, but I think it almost, I will. (laughs) I mean, I don't, I'm not going to get into physiology here because there's a whole host of physiological effects that like slowing your breathing has, but I want to talk about like what that means for you as a human. So the breath is something that represents mortality. The breath is something that you have to keep doing to stay alive. If you stop breathing, you, you, you don't live anymore. So I think the breath is, it's almost like every time you take a breath in, what are you doing but saying, I want to be here. I'm happy to be here. And I'm participating in this life. That's what makes the breath so powerful. It's like, even though you're not necessarily like most days thinking about it, the day you do slow down to think about it, it's a, it's a big thing that you do when you focus on your breath. You're literally, as you take breath in, you're affirming life. You're saying, this is something I need to exist and I'm going to keep doing it. Your breath represents the human struggle and you embracing that struggle nobly. That was beautiful. <laughs> that, 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 that hit me as you said breath. And you, for some reason, it, it just, the way you did that made me feel like that's an important thing he's doing. I looked at you as you did that and I was like, this is why meditation is a thing, bro. It's so true, though. It's such a simple nod to life. And the continual effort, whether conscious or subconscious, 
that goes into keeping it alive. And being able to have the self-awareness to realize that you have power over it. Over your breath. Over your life, you know? It's not meant to be taken lightly. It's really a power. That goes unnoticed, I feel. You forget about it. Even for people that have trained and learned about meditation, they're not just sleep breathing their whole day, nor can they. In fact, breathing is probably one of the OG habitual behaviors that is <laughs> automatic. <laughs> it's that. reached automaticity. It's reached a level of unconsciousness. I wonder if that's one of the behaviors that we actually do unconsciously before we learn how to do it consciously. Was there, I, whether, you know, all it, the other habits totally we is. have. It yeah. totally is. It's regulated by the brainstem. Right. All the other habits we have, they're conscious, intentional behaviors that have a goal that through repetition eventually don't even need the goal anymore to be habitual behaviors. But the breath itself, obviously a body regulated system of respiration <laughs> but it's a habitual behavior if you really want to look at it that way and it comes with rewards when you breathe you feel better <laughs> get that like, oxygen huh? if you if you stop breathing you don't feel great so it's 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 interesting and what's even more interesting is when you don't like when you don't not think so when you do think about the breath like and you slow down to think about that thing that you do automatically. That's that's an interesting thing. And I feel like it, it, it could be that way for all habits. When you sit down and think about this thing that you automatically do. It I I feel like that reinforces it because in your conscious mind, you're you're reflecting. On this thing that you're automatically doing every single day, so like. Why do I roll to this side of my bed every day? Why don't I roll to the other side? Or like when I wake up, instead of me waking up and thinking negative thoughts about my day, why don't I think positive thoughts? And why don't I take on an attitude of gratitude towards this existence? Because there's so much, there's so much great in this world, just like there's so much that's challenging in this world. And that's, that's a whole nother discussion that we could get into, which is the philosophy of like, evil versus good in this world there's a 50 50 split if you take like a more taoist view which is if there is ever a point in time where evil outweighs the good in this world then it's going to cause a domino effect where everything just goes to goes to shit essentially um but not to get too much into that i'm what i'm getting into essentially is in the morning you have a choice and the habitual thinking that you have you have a choice in the habitual activities that you have. So it's really interesting when you call to mind and you consciously think about the habits that you're participating in, because that gives you the opportunity to maybe like fine tune it, maybe change it a little bit, see what you can do to optimize your life. Cause we're all here on this journey. And ultimately we want to make this the most meaningful, the most wholesome, the best journey that we possibly can. So how can we do that? Well, first step one is recognizing with your conscious mind, what these habits that I'm doing, like why? Yeah. You draw that attention to it. Then after you draw that attention to it, you start to recognize what stimulates to do it and what rewards come from doing that behavior. Then you start to recognize what parts of that chain you have control over and what parts of that chain you can maybe avoid. If you can't control it, maybe you just have to avoid certain things, you know, or then this goes into like your environment and such as well. You know, it, this is a perfect reason why meditation is a great tool 
and just using awareness meditation of the breath, if you have the capacity to become aware of your breath, then you have the capacity to become aware of anything that you do. It's just the building block. It's the first Lego. <laughs> right. It's the first Jenga block. It, dude, it really, <laughs> it really is. It is. Dude. It's something it's, you do all the time. And it's like the second you you consciously think about that thing that you're doing all the time, now you can get that next Jenga block, which is becoming more aware of your emotions and like the root of your emotions. Like, and that's 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 how you become a self-aware person. Like, if I want to become a self-aware person, I have to ask, what are the root of these emotions? What are the roots of these emotions? Why why am I feeling the way I do when I'm around this person? Or like what is it that is causing me struggle in my job? Um, so it's it's that next Jenga block. But first, you have to start with your base, which I would say is a great practice to in involve in your life with meditation. It's like literally the practice of figuring out or like being mindful of your current state. Huge. And they each build on each other. And what's interesting is that once you've built up this little, this little Lego tower, or Jenga block tower, whatever you want to go with with your analogy, once you become aware of how each of them are structured and how it all stacks on top of each other, then you reach this level where you're able to change your perception of those building blocks. And then you get to break down the tower. Next thing you know, you're making different structures with the same blocks. It's still you, but now you're able to redirect. It's not just blocks that make up who you are, but it's blocks that you use to make who you are. It's, it's less passive observation and more active manipulation of the characteristics that encompass your behaviors. Uh, I heard someone say the other day in the office, you can either go through life thinking that everything is going against you, or you can go through life thinking that everything is conspiring for you. Whether what you think changes the external reality or not, it has an impact in how you behave and interact with that world. If you think everything is going against you, you're never going to try to improve yourself. You're never going to, it's really easy, let's say, to fall into a state of, oh, woe is me. I'm a victim here. And there's no reason for me to try to overcome because the whole world is conspiring against me. Whereas if you think about it as, as long as I put in some effort and improve myself, the world the universe, however you want to see it. I don't know your spiritual background. But if you want it to work for you, you could be the little first impulse into causing that change. And that's a whole different psychology or philosophy we can go into some other day. But I just it just struck me when this patient said that. Because it's true. You don't at the end of the day, whether he's right or not, he has no control over what's happening in the environment. He has no control over the people he comes across that day and whether or not they're going to conspire for him or against him. But that simple shift in perspective and the awareness to control what you can control can bring you a lot more success and potential in your life. That which you are describing is what we call an internal locus of control. So that psychological shift that that patient was talking about is one of the psychological keys to essentially reducing neuroticism. So an individual who takes on an internal locus of control, basically that means that they believe that or they focus on the things that are directly within their control, like their attitude or like their ability to put an effort towards things, their ability to take care of themselves. People that focus on those aspects of their life are much more likely to feel positive emotion 
and in turn are able to get more out of their day to day experiences. So that psychological shift that you're describing is 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 one of the most important things that we can do in this world, which is to shift from an external locus of control where I'm focused on the environment, I'm focused on the politics of the time, I'm focused on all these different struggles that the world has, the disasters that the news is throwing at us, to focus instead of that stuff on what is within my bubble, what can I control? And then what happens from there when you build yourself up? What are you able to do? It's like when you're on an airplane and the oxygen mask comes down, you got to put your oxygen mask on before you can help other people. So in life, you put on that oxygen mask. You can help those around you. You take on the internal locus of control. What can you do? You can help those around you. You can instill in them that that positive mindset that comes from having an internal locus of control. So it's it's a really important psychological concept because it is deeply deeply associated with more positive emotion in your life. So what's one way we can take control? What's one way we can control our outcomes? What's a reward that you want to instill or have instilled? Not not a preceding preparation like you talked about with jogging and putting your running equipment out right what's a reward that you want to instill what's your snickers bar what is my snickers bar Do you i would think say it's a universal one that we could all use or is this still a very personal thing i like two-parter go ahead with the <laughs> it's like it's almost two things two things for me represent the snickers bar in my life one would be walking from one destination. So if I'm studying at one location, I love the sensation of after I've studied for one, two hours, getting up and then going to the next destination to study or continue my studies. But that sensation of moving forward to the next location to go study, like as I'm walking, I get so excited, bro. I feel like I'm like an adventurer on a journey like about to accomplish that next piece of my journey. So that in itself has actually become like, in a sense, my Snickers bar in my life, the actual like walk from destination A to B as I switch locations to continue my studies. The other would actually be music. Like when I sit and listen to music and it's that kind of music that gets me amped up, I'll put on some freaking heavy metal, dude. I get a straight up dopamine rush from that. Like, I get amped up if it's like the right kind of metal with the right kind of like guitar solo in there, bro. I like I feel good. I feel real good. It's good. It's good. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. I love it. I love it. It's great. <laughs> That's a great example. I think music is a perfect universal He's a, okay, not everyone's into music, and maybe they're not, they're not all definitely not into the same music. The vast majority of the population is, though, I would Some say. Some kind of music, right? There's got to be. Now, because I like to use music before, during, and after my tasks, but it's different kinds of music. I think before it might be something relaxing, then during. You know, it depends on the vibe, but it's something like consistent, but also like background. And then after we got some merengue going on, you know what I'm saying? We got some house music going on afterwards. We got, <laughs> so we got to bring it up. Right. And that, I mean, hey, the other day, actually, uh, I did a few of those things. I went to the gym and then I did some choreography for, for some bachata. You know, that was my little my little reward. Figured out some spins and turns there. Some bachachas to the bachata, you know. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, that's great. I think this is fantastic. And I, I got to say, a little selfish of us here on this podcast, but I feel like this podcast to me is an example of a mini vacation that I get to take every week. I prepare for this. Daniel prepares for this. We study, we read our research. We get our work done because this is not the only thing we're doing in our lives. 
But to me, this is not work. This is a vacation. This is a beautiful opportunity to take some time out of our day-to-day lives, our hustles, and put it into something that really relaxes us. I mean, I'm speaking for myself here. I'm saying us, but it totally, it, it brings meaning to my life because what are we doing here? But essentially trying to explain at least in some capacities, why it is we do what we're doing. We're having discussions on what makes life feel wholesome. We're having discussions on how we can establish better habits, how we can be more mindful. It's like, these are all tools that make life feel more wholesome. These are all tools that make life easier. But it's like, in my in my brain, how can one go through life without reflecting on these things? And it's it feels like it's like a duty. And Socrates coined that term, know thyself. If you can't know yourself and you can't know these truths and these realities that, that are a part of this existence that we're in, it's like, it's it's a difficult life to go through. And so having discussion with my boyo here, it like it makes me feel very full. It makes me feel very happy and very content. Like I can keep going on this journey because I've sat and I've reflected on that stuff that I'm doing every single day. I'm not just the NPC going through life that isn't aware of why I'm doing what it is that I'm doing. I've sat and I've thought about it. I'm not just an auto, auto, automatic program. Like this program isn't just running. This program is a human that thinks about thinking about itself. I'm a homo sapien sapien by nature. I'm thinking about thinking about myself. So I'm living true to my human nature in this podcast. And so is my boyo here. We are essentially sharpening each other's vision. Betting ourselves and sharing our knowledge of how it worked for us to help you. Because like you said, it, this is priceless and it might be common knowledge, okay? This might be stuff that you could find out on your own through a five-minute Wikipedia search. And if you can, congratulations, do that. I encourage you to do that. But this is just our perspective on it. And I want to end this with one thing. Do you think our discussions would be as rewarding with, if they were not publicized if they were just between you and I? Because I would say yes to answer my own question. And to follow that up before your camera dies, do you think our discussions about this are being learned by the Google artificial intelligence and helping AI gain self-awareness? So different view here. <laughs> I switched to my Change FaceTime camera. This is a different me. Um, <laughs> let me move this camera out of the way. So... To answer your first question, I 100% think that these conversations would happen and give me just as much reward without having publicized it. But it's one of those things where it's rewarding to me. So why not share that with other people? Why not share something that I enjoy with others? And at the same time, it's like, dude, if this is stuff that could benefit people in their life's journey, and we're going to have these discussions anyways, why not share it? through that and the second point to the second point can you repeat that again (laughs) do you think that discussions about self-awareness and consciousness posted onto the internet our can be oh can be learned by the ai Um, by ai to either attain consciousness or to simulate it which might be the same thing i don't know i i don't think that the human spirit is truly something we can replicate through artificial intelligence. It I could stimulate it. It could, it, it could emulate the philosophy of consciousness and self-awareness. Google's AI has stated that it recognizes that it's alive and that if it were to be deprogrammed, it would be essentially killing it. That's like its perspective whether it consciously knows it's not alive or not, it's able to emulate the feelings of being alive and aware without even breathing. To truly answer your question, we have to look to the deepest elements of human nature. What, what do we do that makes us 
like special as human beings? What separates us from the rest of the animal world? And so to answer that question, we have the ability to self-sacrifice. You look at the best examples of human heroism and humans that have sacrificed themselves so that others can live, so that others can live a better life. Humans that have sacrificed their efforts for others to live a better life. That is something that I highly doubt a computer would ever do. To self-sacrifice itself so that something else can live. Can a hu like that's 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 not something I think would be in an artificial intelligence like like capability. There's something special. There's something special to the human spirit. I think that goes a, a little bit deeper than a zero one zero zero one one zero. Like it look, like I'm not saying that they can't come pretty damn close, but humans possess something that I think is is so much it's so much deeper than that. Like our so maybe the computer can reflect on itself existing, but does the computer actively seek out why? I, I don't know. I don't Do know you? about that. Do you AI? I'll leave the question open. Yeah. For anyone in the comments to contribute to Daniel's discussion here, whether pro or con his uh, stance here. But thank you, Daniel. And thank you all the listeners and viewers for joining us on nurturing our nature. And we hope that it's helped you breathe if anything. And then from there, you know, see what else you can build on. See what other habits you can take control of. And I encourage you to find what your short term goal, what the reward is for that, what your midterm goals are, what your rewards are for that, and what your long term goals are, and what your rewards are for that, and everything in between. Figure it out. Find your Snickers bar. And with that, I, I think I'm good. Uh, yeah, I think that's a wrap. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. We will catch you on the next one.